Amen. If you have your Bible or Bible app today, I want you to go to Jonah chapter 4. We are going to end this series that we've been in on Jonah. If you're just joining us, we did a couple of weeks, and then we had to take a week off to do a, a talk about life group launch, and we did that last week, and I hope and trust your life groups are going well, and I want to echo that. If you haven't found a life group, talk to us, okay? We'd like to help you. We'd like to coach you up on that. We'd like to connect you with, with some folks that you can be meeting with weekly, um, and so that, that, that would be our version of Sunday School. And so um, if you would, uh, just please talk to us. Rob and Beth are doing a great job of that. Uh, you can also talk to Craig or myself, and we'll be glad to pl plug you in. Today, as we end this incredible story in Jonah, we're going to look and go through Jonah chapter 4. So we've basically spent uh, one message on each chapter, and today we're going to finalize it. This week, as I was pinning this out, I began to think about um, children's stories, and there was one reason behind that. When we look at a child's story and you get to the end of it, it has a tendency, at least the old ones did, it had this tendency of phrase that ended the book, and it would kind of put a bow on it. It'd make you feel great emotionally and about the characters and the story itself, and the phrase would say this, and they lived, finish it, happily ever after. And it was like, oh, that's wonderful. They, they grew up and they grew more in love and they, you know, died together holding hands on, with rocking, in rocking chairs on the front porch. It was wonderful. They lived happily ever after. This is how in our minds we wish that every story would end with warm fuzzies and everything tied together so nicely. As a matter of fact, most of us in this room, we hate terrible endings. We hate um, watching anything, experiencing anything, reading anything that's got an awful ending. And, you know, we think about a couple of those examples. You know, sports this week really kicked back in with football, the only important sport. And Mahomes loses a season opener for the first time in five years. No, no applauding, I'm serious. And uh, Alabama loses at home. You can clap to that if you want. Um, yeah. Arch Manning doesn't get a single snap in the past couple of weeks. It's just, it's just disappointment, right? It's not supposed to be this way. And when I think about some of the movies that I've seen, this is going to tell my, my age, but it drives me crazy when movies don't, don't end well. If you remember the old movie, The Titanic, you've got you know these two people who are in love floating around in ice, and Rose is on a, a, a board or a door or something. There's plenty of room for two people, uh, but she doesn't include him. And so this is not, listen, I'm serious. This is not a term of endearment. It was murder, Okay. <laughs> She chose to end his life, and, and, and so um, it ended terribly. If you remember that, that old movie, City of Angels, with uh, Nick, Nicolas Cage and Meg Ryan, you know, it took them an uh, entire movie to fall in love, and then the last, you know, Robbie and I are watching it, and it's like incredible. We're like, all right, great, they found each other. And the last two minutes, Meg Ryan dies by getting hit by a log truck on a bicycle. I mean, we had to go to counseling for it. You know, we were like, there was like, we didn't, we didn't even see it coming. You know, she didn't either. It was just, you know, this logging truck incident. It's awful. And if you text me today and you say, I was going to watch that. No, you weren't. Okay, that movie's 20 years old. So we've been in this book for a month of Jonah. We knew it as children um, we kind of understood the big pieces of it, the parts your Sunday school teacher showed you on a flannel graph board. You were like, I got it. I got the principle. But this, this fourth chapter is the one that they never play out. It's the one they never teach you about. And so there's a big thing, and I just want to start by declaring one big thing, and it's this. You and I could be Jonah. All right, And we kind of started week one with that, with going, hey, this guy's not far from you and I. I think chapter four really drives that point home that this could be you and me in this story. I've been this guy so many times in my life, and the book ends with an unsettled argument between Jonah and God. 
So it kind of ends with a question mark. There is no happily ever after. It doesn't tie up well. It ends with so much ambiguity that if you're a theologian or just a strong studier of Scripture, student of Scripture, then you go, man, I hate the way that thing ends. Um, so how many of you married people have ever gone to bed at night with an argument? Like you, you ended the night, it didn't go well. Ma'am, you don't have to raise both hands. I saw it the, the first time, yeah. So you, you, you go to bed and, and you have an argument and, and you're kind of passing each other in the hallway and you're, you, know, you don't look at each other anymore. You just, you're trying to just get away from each other, but your house is too small to, to go anywhere else. And so Jonah is this way with God. He's in an argument. It's not good. It doesn't end well. And Jonah is full of what I'm going to call worthless emotion. Okay, so he's got all these things going on. I'm going I'm to draw some of that out in just a minute. But I think in modern terms, we should really call what Jonah is experiencing as resentment. He doesn't like what has happened in, in any way, even though some good has happened for these people. And his resentment has been boiling over for three chapters. Now, if, you're, if this is your first day in this series, you're going to want to go back and listen to what we've al already talked about. But I, I will recap just for a moment. As you know, Jonah, the only prophet who said, I'm not going to do what I'm asked, uh, I think I'll go the other direction, so he runs from God. Big thing here, okay? You can run from God, but you have to know at some point you're going to run right into him. All right? So also, not only does he run from God, but Jonah was prejudiced. Okay? So God created these people, and Jonah does not want to reach them. So Jonah, as a prophet, as a man of God, so there's an entire group. I do not want to talk to. You can send me to a group I like, and I'll preach all day long. I'll share good news all day, but there's this group I don't want to talk to, okay? So he had prejudice. Jonah made an idol out of politics, and God was very clear. You're not going to have any other God before me. But there was politics involved and conflict involved between the people of God and the Ninevites, okay? A big conflict and he said, I don't, I don't want to do this because I have prejudice and I have political uh, problems with what's going on. And then lastly, Jonah loved God, but he did not love his mission. And I think this is really relevant. I think sometimes you and I can get caught in this, is that we go, I love God. Okay, I, I'm trying to have a relationship with God. I'm trying to, I love God so much, I'm trying to lead my children into a relationship with God. But I don't really care for God's mission over my life, or I don't care for God's mission in my community. And so this was him. And it makes me say, again, this could be any of us on any given day. So there's lots of resentment that is just sitting around, and resentment is that thing in you that's kind of, it's quiet, but in your mind it's really loud. It's not like you're sharing your resentment with everybody, but man, your thoughts are filled with volume about resentment. You can walk into the right room, and man, your blood pressure goes up. You get tense. You, you want to let people have it. You want to express your thought to them. You want to give an opinion. And it's just that resentment just kind of hangs out. It's like it's always sitting at the table, just waiting for other people to join it. It's a very difficult emotion to, to navigate. But let's go to Jonah 4. I'm going to read all 11 verses quickly. And this is the ESV today. This is what it says. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Verse 3. Now, Lord, watch this, take away my life. It's better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Verse 5, 
Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter. This is what they don't teach you in Sunday school. And he sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm. The worm chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, here's that phrase again, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew weary. He wanted to die. It's a second reference to that. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah again, is it right for you to be angry about the plant. Watch what Jonah says. It is. How bad of a place do you have to be in when God is saying, hey, is it okay for you to feel this way? And your first response is, yes, it is. Okay? Maybe you've been there. He says, again, the third reference, I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend it, you did not make it grow. It sprang up overnight. It died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? Amazing conversation. So I want to spend a little bit of time this morning talking about the fruits of resentment. That when God has you in a place that is his mission for your life, his purpose for your life, a specific chapter in your life, and you have grown bitter about it. Like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to go through this. I don't deserve this. I'm a better prophet than this. I've lived a holy life. I think I deserve some holy outcome. I deserve some joy. I deserve some happiness. And God is saying, hey, wait a minute. Is it okay for you to feel this way? It sure is. And you begin to give God your resume or talk through as to why you feel like you should not be in the place that that you're in. And I preface this during the first week. Jonah is not a bad guy. Jonah is an incredible person. He's just made some terrible decisions, and he's let this resentment start to drive his ministry. It started to dr- it's taking over his attitude. It's taking over his giftedness. So the first thing he starts to do is he begins to take on this attitude, this demeanor of complaining. And I want to talk this out for a second because this is very popular in, in our culture. That it's okay for me to not only have an opinion, but to project it anywhere and everywhere. And I start to just complain about all of it. The same thing about God, about the church, about the political landscape, about my community, about what's going on everywhere, at my job, who my boss is, what, why I should be elevated, why I should be lifted up in this heavy I don't want to over-spiritualize it, but let's call it this for a moment. This spirit of criticism kind of enters the church, enters a community, hovers over you, and you can't get out from under this dark cloud of just critiquing every single thing. That comes from a place in you. It comes from a place in me that we have to be aware it's there. This fruit of resentment is that I become easily frustrated and I'm, I, be, I begin to be a complainer. But when you look at this from 40,000 feet, you see that no matter how many miracles transpired, he's still complaining. He was safe from a storm, safe from sailors. Those guys could have easily said, you're the problem. We're not just going to throw you in. We're going to kill you and throw you in. He was saved from them. He's saved from drowning. He's saved from a fish. You would think he would come out the other side of this experiment going, um, man, 
how grateful am I? Look at what just happened. Look at what the Lord rescued me from. I'm just filled with gratitude. Thank you, God. But he doesn't. The fact is, all the miracles that can happen for you pales in comparison to the miracles that must happen in you. There's a difference in for you and in you. And the first miracle that must take place is we must have a full surrender in our heart and in our spirit. Our soul is rescued. We are transformed to the power of the Holy Spirit to say, I want my life to be different. I don't want to sit around and be a person who's complaining and critiquing and just frustrated. But Jonah is a complainer. I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want you to answer this in, in your head. Have you ever been close to a complainer? You might be married to one. You might be raising one. You might work for one. Complainer. There's a story, just a joke, obviously. There's this guy, let's call him Ed. It's a good, good name. And Ed's got a terrible neighbor, right? And so no matter what he does, the neighbor's complaining. He mows the grass. The neighbor's complaining that when he blew his driveway, some of it came out of Ed's yard and into his yard. Keep your clippings to yourself, he yells across the street. Ed takes out the trash. Ed's neighbor wants to know, you know how, how quickly he can get those cans back out of the notice of the, of the street view. He's just complaining. He has people over. Ed's out there making sure nobody's tires are in his grass. Keep your, keep your company to yourself. Ed's wife comes to him and she says, hey, why don't you take him? You got you to gotta take him and, 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 and end this. He won't have a thing to say. He'll be speechless. Well, Ed had taught Spot how to retrieve ducks, but he taught him to do it by walking on water. So he comes out, he takes his neighbor duck hunting and puts Spot on the little stand and he's got his neoprene vest on, he looks sharp, he's ready to go to work and Ed drops two ducks and the ducks hit the water and he says, go get them, Spot. And sure enough, he jumps off the stand, he runs across the water, grabs the duck, brings it back, drops it in, in the blind, runs back out across the water and grabs the second duck, brings it back, jumps up on his stand, quiet as he can be and Ed looks over at his neighbor and his neighbor says, dumb dog, can't even swim. Okay. This is where Jonah's heart is at, okay? This is Jonah. This is dumb. Loaded with miracles. Looks around. All the good things that, that, that are, are, are happening. And I don't want to take pause here and spend time on it, but you can. I, I want you to think, just come back to a moment for just a second about how blessed you are. That you've got children, that you've got a job, that you've got a home, that you drove a car, that we're in an air-conditioned church with comfortable seating, that, that we've got food to eat, that we've got friendships, that we've got all kinds, these are all kinds of things that add up to the fact that you and I are okay. We're good. We are so blessed. Don't get caught saying dumb dog can't swim because we're surrounded with, with, with miracles. So Jonah takes his resentment and creates a second fruit with it. And this is the one that God mentions because he's so angry. Jonah begins to be angry. And three times in chapter 4, the Bible talks about it. We just read it. In the Hebrew, that word anger that we just read actually translates to more of he has lost it. Okay? So we think about like you see someone and they're so mad that you go, man, that person has lost it, okay? You ever see somebody at a, a ball game or a restaurant, and it's completely out of context? It's like, whoa, that doesn't even fit what's going on because that person has lost it. That's the word that this is trying to communicate to us. This is how silly Jonah is being. It's how angry he is, and he's aimed this at God and people and where he's at, and he's so angry that this word comes out, he has lost it. Okay? I don't know if you've ever been there. But this is why the Bible also teaches us, be angry, sin not. Okay to be angry, not okay to sin. Be angry, don't freak out on people. Be angry, don't lose your mind. 
It's okay to be angry. So sometimes, sometimes anger can save your life. Sometimes anger is standing up for yourself or for your family. That's okay. Be angry. Don't sin in the process. So these emotions are not just random, but they tend to have first cousins that have a family reunion, and this becomes very sequential very fast. So just as the fish swallows Jonah, Jonah swallows his anger, and I want you to watch the progression of this. The anger turns into self-pity. So now I'm mad, and now I'm saying, this is not how I plan for my life to turn out. Again, you start to issue God, your, your resume to God. I've told you this many times, and I'm not going to camp out here, but for me, the very first time I did this is when we lost our first child, and I looked at God, and I, and I said, you know, do you not know that I have given my life to the ministry? You know? I'm trying to hand God a, a Vita. I want you to look, look, look over here on page three. Why is this happening to us when we have done X, Y, and Z? It's so tempting in that moment when you are just resentful and bitter and confused to, to hand something over to God and say, do you not see my life and what I have done and how much I love you? And I love you so much, I am mad at you. Again, it's where he's at. And so Jonah goes from anger to self-pity, and that boils until it turns into depression. I once read de that depression was described as a frozen anger. I love that. It's like, it's like my anger has stalled out, and it's camping out, and it's lost traction, and it lost traction in me, and now it's just frozen, stuck there, and I'm so angry that now I'm depressed about it. I can't tow it out. I can't pull it out. I can't medicine it out. I can't vacation it out. It's just sitting inside of me, spinning. It's frozen anger, and Jonah takes that depression, and he does what you and I talked about two weeks ago when we talked about life group launch, he does something terrible and he isolates it. He decides, I'm just going to be by myself. I don't need Nineveh. I don't need, I don't need you. I don't need any of this. I'm just going to go be by myself. I'm going to go make a shelter on the east side of this city and sit in it and suck my thumb and just be there. And I don't care what happens. I'm just going to watch. I'm just going to watch from a distance about what's going on. Isolating. We had a rule growing up at our house. I don't know if you were raised the same way I was, but we had a rule. My, my parents were like, if they got on to us, it was okay for us to be upset. That, I mean, they didn't expect us to have great joy over it, right? So they would get on to us, and I would say, can I go to my room? And my dad would say, sure, that's great. Go in there and think about it for a while. Come back out when you're happy. And I'd march through the hallways, and I'd go to my room. But we had one rule. You cannot shut your door. And that really stank. And one time, I made the terrible mistake of slamming a door to make a point. I don't think I had that door back for a couple of weeks. It was off the hinges. I told my dad, I... I need to change clothes. Well, go around the corner because you don't have a door anymore. You slam it. You stand in your closet. You get, this is ridiculous. This is my sacred space. My parents did not buy into that. No. We, 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 we got that. I pay the bills here. That includes all square footage that you enjoy. I bought all the clothes. I can inspect them. I bought all the furniture. I can open that drawer. And there was no sacred space. You just got to live there. Here, here was, was the point. The principle was, if you go in there and you shut the door, it's only you and your thoughts, and that's a dangerous place to be. Leave the door open. See us walk by you. Stay engaged in the process of our family. So when you get mad and get alone, you will unintentionally, okay? And that, that, that's a big word for us right now, okay? Hear it. When you get mad and get alone, you will unintentionally formulate a plot for self-destruction. 
It's not like you sit down and get out a piece of paper and some highlighters and you, you really go to work. You will unintentionally have, have a thought that leads to another and you entertain it and you entertain another and like Tetris, you just start piecing it all together and stacking it and filling all the holes until it starts to make one complete tapestry of self-destruction. Jonah started, let's talk about it because it's in here three times, Jonah started having suicidal thoughts. I'm so bitter about this. I'm so resentful. I'm so full of self-pity. I am so depressed. I am so angry. He says this to the Lord, just kill me. I want to die. Take me now. I'm not going to ask you again to raise your hand, but I would bet that there are several of you in this room who have been in such a spot that in a moment of weakness you've prayed the same prayer. It's ended. It's not worth it. I'm so hurt. I'm so mad. I, I'm never going to get over this. So you might as well just take me now. When anger gets to this point, we are ready for something to pay a price. We are ready for something to die. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to be careful here, but just, just hear me out. When we get to this place, where what's happening in your spirit bubbles up and comes out your mouth and entertains your thought and takes over your being, this is when you will choke the life out of your own marriage. You will kill your own integrity. You will kill and sabotage your own your own career. You don't need anybody else to do it for you. You think if Jonah had another option in this frame of mind, I just want to be something different. I, want, I don't want to be a prophet anymore. I want to resign that, and I want to do something else. You think he would have done it? I do. I think he would have said, if there was another door of opportunity, I'm ready to exit. This is how it, it can happen. But listen, this story ends strangely. And if you're not with me, plug in right now, okay? Because this is going to end in a very unique way. Jonah goes out to the city, out to the edge of the city, and he just wants to watch. I just want to see what God's going to do. I've preached. I've done my job. I'm just going to go sit out on this hill and see what happens. I want to see if revival breaks out or if fire falls. I just want to watch. And so God makes this plant grow up. This is, I, I get it. He makes this plant grow up, and the plant provides shade. And it says, Jonah's happy. About time, somebody throws me a bone. I've been preaching for days. About, about time you shade me. About time you give me a break. Goodness. He loves it. Thank you. Finally, you see me. You've heard me. And then it says that God provides a worm, and the worm goes in and eats the shade. Shade falls. You think Jonah's happy about that? Yeah, he's not. And then it says that God provides an east wind. That translates, it, it's Sharaka. And a Sharaka is, is in that part of the world is a hot, hot wind that can immediately raise the temperature 15 to 25 degrees. He's just scorching on him. The body gets angry. And God confronts him. Hey, is it okay for you to be angry? Jonah says, it is. Because you gave me some shade. You took it. This wind is killing me. I already want to die. As a matter of fact, just end it. He gets suicidal again. And the Lord says to him, you've been concerned about a plant, okay? Here's where this gets really relevant for the church. You've been concerned about a plant, but you didn't grow it. You didn't tend to it. It sprang up overnight. It died overnight. And should I not have concern for the city of Nineveh in which there is 120,000 people who do not know their left hand from their right? This is what God is saying. Work with me. Work with me. I believe you're the person for the job. Change your attitude. Change your mind. Get it together. Work with me. Get over yourself. 
and work with me. You are more upset over a plant than over 120,000 people. Here it comes. Are we, are you, are you and me, are we concerned about all the wrong things? Think about it for just a second. And I, I don't want to end this being ugly, but I, I, I want you to think about this. Remember the old, the old adage about you know what, what you care about if you look in your check register? You start to see things that you've given to or bought. You, it's kind of a, a scale of going, hey, that's the stuff my life is interested in. I want to ask, ask you this. Assess your prayer life really quick. What are the things you're praying about? Is it always for a raise? Is it always for the opportunity? Like when is the last time that we've really prayed for the city, for the neighbor, for the coworker, for the person you're married to? When's the last time like we've really gone to prayer for that? Or has it always been like, God, change my life, make it better, heal this, do that? And, and, and again, without being too crass, God becomes like, like this ATM type mentality. I'm a, I want to drive up. I want to make a deposit. I want to get, get what he's given, and then, and then my life is going to be better. Or are we really connected to the heart of God? Because I'm going to tell you something, the heart of God is with these people. It's with the 120,000. Jonah is concerned, please get this today. Jonah is concerned that Nineveh is not getting what they deserve. He wants them to be punished. He wants them to be annihilated. He wants them wiped out. Jonah is concerned that he's not getting what he deserves, which is what he wants. And God is saying, my concern is that no one get what they deserve. Because if everyone gets what they deserve, you're in a fish and Nineveh is destroyed. So this is where I'm hypocritical like, like Jonah. Because sometimes I care more about the plant than the city. Sometimes I care more about the shade. I care more about the thing that makes me happy. I care more about the thing that makes me feel like I'm progressing. I care more about the thing that's giving me dopamine. I care more about that than about the city, than about the person, than about the people, than about why the church is established. So Jonah teaches us that you can have great theology and completely miss the heart of God. So let me end, end with this. Here's the crescendo of this message. I'm going to close in 30 seconds. God wasn't sending Jonah to fix Nineveh. He was using Nineveh to fix Jonah. And you may think that God is only wanting to call you into what he's called you into right now for you to fix something, for you to better it, that he needs your skill set, but that's not the case. Some of you are where you are right now because God is working something out of you. That he's growing you, shaping you, calling you to deeper depths. This is not about your skill set. It's not because you're so smart. He's had to call you in. This is about you being in a situation where there's a shaking of hands. And God can use tumultuous times to shape us in incredible ways. That is the story of this book. It's not go over there and do something that you don't want to do because I'm God and you're not. This is about I see something in your life. Now you're the best tool I've got here. However, when you get there, I'm going to work on you. You're going to give to Nineveh, and Nineveh's going to give to you. And it's going to be a win-win. And we're going to have a better city, and we're going to have a better Jonah. 
And that's how we're going to land it. We're going to land it by knowing that the most important thing we can get out of this is to get over ourselves, to realize how blessed we are, how incredible of a life God has given us, that he loves your coworker and your neighbor and the people in your life group so much more than giving you the next thing that brings you joy. So that's going to be my prayer over us today. All right. Father, I love you. I, I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful that it it's double-edged, that it it's surgical going in and healing coming out. And today I pray if we're in this room and we are loaded with resentment, that we would realize there's, that the mission is more important than how I feel. Your heart for me, your heart for the people I live with, your heart for our church, our life groups, our neighbors, our coworkers is more important than the shade that makes us happy. So I pray today against bitterness and against resentment and against anger and against depression and against the things that we have loaded ourselves with. That we have weaponized our own spirituality. Forgive us. Forgive us. Please let us connect to your heart on this. Don't let us miss the point. So free us today of pent-up emotion, of things we've carried. And if that's you today, right now, I encourage you just to start to open your hands of those things. Will you do that? Will you open your heart? And let bitterness out. Will you open your heart and not be angry anymore? Will you stop gritting your teeth, shaking your fists? Lord, forgive us. Forgive us. Let us come back to the importance of people, of our people, of our church, our family, our city, and how much you love us. And we give you thanks for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You guys stand with me all across the building this morning. We're about to have a time of worship, and as we do that, I want to remind you there's communion in the back on each side, self-serve communion. I encourage you to go and get that. During this time, feel free to move around and get that. There's prayer cards back there as well. So fill out a prayer card. I promise you, we'll pray over it. All right? And then let's just worship the Lord today. And if, if this meant anything to you, if any of this stuck to your heart today, I would challenge you to just use this time to talk to the Lord about it. Okay, make make this a time of prayer and altar for yourself.